Good morning and welcome. I am Joanne Jessen, a member of the board of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Reston. Whether you are on Zoom or here in the church sanctuary, we are so glad you are with us this morning. Looks like everyone remembered to turn their clocks ahead. No matter how old or how young you are, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, however you identify and whomever you love, know you are welcome here. Speaking of here, this place looks a little different from what it looked like last night. And we want to take a minute to express our gratitude to everyone who made last night's stewardship gala such a resounding success. Under the direction of Cynthia, the choir filled the sanctuary with beautiful music, and we had Alan Naylor and Karen Vincent do a fantastic job sharing their talents with us. And of course, a huge thank you to our amazing volunteers and staff that made the evening so special. And of course, the congregation who came and supported this wonderful effort. And I think we need a round of applause for our stewardship co-chairs, Maggie Mack and Nani Mullen. Thank you both. Please join us for Science Sunday today after the service. The shape of the universe, did time begin and will it end, will be facilitated by physicist and UUCR member Mike Albro, and it will begin 20 minutes after the service ends here in the sanctuary, so coffee will be in the east foyer. And it'll also be streamed on Zoom in the same Zoom link as the service. So if you want to watch on Zoom, just stay in the same space. And also, we welcome this morning a guest musician, Nathaniel Wolf. Nathaniel is a freelance oboist, teacher, and chamber musician <clears throat> dedicated to sharing the music he finds wondrous and fascinating. He is the oboist for the wind quartet Ignis, with whom he has won multiple awards in national competitions. Welcome, Nathaniel. We are so happy you are here. So let's center ourselves for worship. Take some deep, quieting breaths as we and we'll center. We'll prepare to worship together as we enjoy this morning's prelude.
Good morning. I am Reverend Aileen Fitzke, and it is my honor to serve this congregation as its minister. And I just want to add my thanks to Maggie and Nani for the wonderful evening last night. And I don't know about anybody else, but I woke up singing Rainbow Connection in my head <laughs> this morning. <clears throat> Our opening words are by the Reverend Dr. David Breeden. Welcome to this place where certainty transforms to questions. This place that takes what is and imagines what can be. Welcome to this place where what was fixed begins to shift, where rigidity embraces unfolding as we join in the dance of transformation. Welcome to this moment of change where together we transfigure and transcend together. Good morning. Our opening hymn today is number 1000 in the Teal Hymnal, the first song in the Teal Hymnal, Morning Has Come. So please rise in body or spirit and join us in singing. Sterling Paulette, welcome to our church. It's now time to light the chalice. The words for our chalice lighting come from Michelle Collins. It's called Changes Abound. Changes abound around us, within us, between us in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our beloved faith communities. Changes abound. May we each find the balance point we need as we move through our ever-changing world. The balance between the old and the new. The balance between the known and the unknown. Between the familiar and perhaps bold and risky possibilities that may be there 
waiting. Here at UUCR, we have a tradition of singing our covenant together every Sunday. Love is the spirit of this church. Um, the words will appear on the screen in front of you, and we will remain seated to sing our covenant together. If you are visiting us today for the first time, please accept this song as our blessing to you. the time for all ages so if you're feeling young of body we have some space on the floor if you'd like to come up and get a little bit closer welcome welcome it's so great to see you all I wonder how many of you have seen a doctor who is a woman raise your hand if you have yes I think I see all of our hands raised, right? Now, let's travel back in time, 175 years or so, to 1847. How many doctors do you think you would see in the US who were women? <gasps> That's right, exactly none. Nada, zero, zilch, zip, none at all. But there was a woman who dreamed of becoming a doctor to help people. And she changed our world through her beliefs and her actions. This woman was named Elizabeth Blackwell and she was a Unitarian. Yes. Now we move to 1853, and Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell is behind a door with her eyes shut, and she slowly, slowly opens the door, and she peeks out with one eye, looking to the left and looking to the right. And what she sees makes her heart beat faster. The room is full. People who helped her put up signs throughout the neighborhood that had said, free clinic. But no one knew if any patients would show up. But the dream had come true. There were all these patients there to see her. And she so happy. Elizabeth Blackwell had been the first woman in the US to be accepted to a medical college. She had been the first woman accepted or who graduated from a medical college and she was the top in her class. She had gone to France and England to study and she'd worked in hospitals and clinics. But when she returned to the US, no hospital would let her join their staff. No medical schools would hire her. And since she couldn't get a, doc a job as a doctor in the US, 
she decided to start her own clinic. She bought a house in New York in the poorest section of the city. She lived upstairs and had that room downstairs where she would see patients. That room that was full on the first day. That first year, she saw over 200 patients. And in the next few years, the demand for her service grew so much that people donated money to her. And she was able to start her own hospital to serve these people who many had no money to pay for a doctor. Now, Elizabeth Blackwell was caring and courageous. She had a dream to become a doctor and care for people, and she was determined to go through all the obstacles and make her dream come true. Because of Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell and the many, many women who followed her and refused to step back. Our world is now a very, very different place, isn't it? And this is from a story by the Reverend Denise Tracy. And today, in this service and in religious education, we're going to be talking more about change and how we can each be some of that change. So we will sing the children out, and the words will be projected here. That'll come up in just a second. Um, thank you for pledging and supporting UCR. Thank you to all the volunteers um, who helped make the gala such a success. I've never seen the sanctuary cleaned up faster than last night. Um, <laughs> it was kind of amazing. Um, so thank you. Uh, pl please pick up your pledge cards from Nani or me um, after the service if you haven't gotten it yet. If you have it, um, if you have your, if your pledge card is all filled out, you can return them either online. Um, to the church office or to one of us, to Nani or I. Um, we'll be available after the service if anyone has any questions and we'll have info sessions, um, an info session Q&A Q next, um, the next two services. Do we have the thermometer? Okay, we'll come back to that. There we go. Nope, up here, screen. <laughs> So yeah, we are, um, have our total pledges of $205,100. We have 50 pledges so far. We are at 53% of the goal. So we want to see um, our number of pledges grow and we want to get um, the rest of the, ha we're halfway there. So thanks everybody. We're very excited for that. All right, thank you. Um, all right, I've been a member of UCR for 14 years. My dad was in the Navy, and we, uh, my family moved a lot, around a lot when I was a kid. They moved to Northern Virginia while I was in college. Once I graduated, I moved here too. All my friends lived in other places, though. I spent time with them online through Twitter and Facebook, um, but I didn't have friends um, to hang out with, take walks with, um, 
go to dinner with, or co-chair committees with. <laughs> um, I was pretty lonely back then until I came to UCR. I felt connected to UCR and the people here from the moment I first came to a service. Ooh, did not realize I was gonna get emotional. Um, <laughs> um, and it just felt like home. Um, after a few years, I found a group of friends from people that came to church here, connections with people around my age, quote unquote, young adults. Some of them weren't, and I don't know if any of us qualify anymore. <laughs> Um, we watch TV shows together, we play board games, we take vacations together, we support each other um, by showing up in good times and bad. Four friends have gotten married here, um, and I found many multi-generational multi connections that mean the world to me, especially for my time on a previous ministerial search committee. I give my time and money to UCR because it has given me so much. A group of friends, a place of belonging, a place to learn new things like meditation, a place to serve others, um, a place to experience, to renew experiences like being a member of a ministerial search committee, being part of the production team, um, or co-chairing the stewardship committee. Something I never thought I'd do. <laughs> There's a lyric and spirit of life that has always moved me and meant the world to me. Roots hold me close, wings set me free. UCR is the roots that ground me and connect me to something bigger than, my, than me. I'll keep supporting this place and its people as long as I'm able. I hope you will too. Thank you. Now is the time in our service where we share our joys and concerns so that no one ever has to hold them alone. If you are joining us remotely this morning, you may wish to light a real or virtual candle wherever you are to mark what is in your heart as members of the in-person congregation here place stones in the water. If those of you at home would like to share what is on your heart today in the congregational chat on the screen, please write to all attendees and please remember that what you share will be public. Those at home may then read others' joys and concerns shared in the chat and then enter into your own time of reflection and prayer. As we listen to Daniel, Diane and Nathaniel play our meditation music. So I'd like those of you in the service to come forward and um, place your stones in the bowl.
Wow. Let us be one in prayer and meditation. Spirit of life and love that so faithfully animates our creation. We are grateful for this community that is with us in times of both joy and sorrow. We hold in our hearts this morning all those who are facing any hardship or difficulty, those who are grieving or facing illness or disability in themselves, their friends, or their loved ones. In particular, this morning, we hold in our hearts and prayers all the victims of war and violence. May they soon know peace. For them, we light this candle. Let us now take a moment of silence. The second Sunday of each month is our dedicated offering to an organization chosen by the Social Justice and Action Committee. All of today's offering, except for pledge payments, which should be clearly marked, will go to the Jennifer Mitchell Memorial Scholarship Fund. This fund was established at UUCR in 1990 and set up to support continuing education uh, for graduating seniors from Herndon and South Lakes High School, particularly students who have overcome adversity, financial, language, family situation, etc. Over 30 years, the fund has su supported by UUCR and four other local congregations has generated scholarships for 224 students. In 2023, the fund divided $11,200 among seven high school seniors, three from Herndon and four from South Lakes High Schools. You may make your donation on the link in the chat or and on your order of service, entering your donation into the Charity of the Month donation box in the online form. You can also write a check to UUCR with scholarship in the memo line and put it in the offering basket and mail it or mail it to the church. And of course, you may put cash in the offering basket and that will also go to the fund. Thank you for your generous support of this important community resource.
Thank you, Nathaniel. Thirty or so years ago, I took my first graduate religious studies course. It was called something like Religion and Modern World Culture. It was a critique of modernity, but not in ways you might think. Looking at the accomplishments of the modern era, we also looked at the ways in which, while there were enormous benefits, the modern era had wrought enormous amounts of destruction. Two world wars, genocide of native peoples, slavery, and an industrial culture that had wrought environmental destruction. One book we read in particular, and the only one that I still have from that class, was called Crossing the Postmodern Divide by the philosopher Albert Borgman. It begins, there is a rising sentiment that we are coming to the close not only of a century and a millennium, but also of an era, too. This sentiment has not become universal, yet the indications of closure and transition are manifold. One indication is the difficulty we have of finding the kind of discourse that would help us chart the passage of the present to the future. It is a fascinating book because it was published in 1992, before the rise of the internet. And I read it the first time, before, at the time when I had only two years previously bought my first home computer. What was the most interesting thing about the class and the book was that both asked us to imagine what we thought would be next. In light of our knowledge of the past, what would be a more life-giving, compassionate future? In the book, Borgman imagines different kinds of futures based on the knowledge he had of the past and the present. There were two particular futures he concentrated on. He was not anti-science or technology, but he was a person who thought we needed thoughtful people to create the ways in which technology would work for us to help us create a more compassionate future. The two broad futures he imagined were in stark contrast to each other. One was a hyper-real, hyperactive, hyper-consumerist, hyper-intelligent in terms of computer technology. He was very prescient as he imagined the worst ex excesses of the internet. Even at the time, he only had a small inkling of what that might look like. But the other was a more what he called a flexible and cooperative future, a place of human connection and interaction among both humans and the natural world, a place where people of all faiths and none could come together to celebrate, to feed the hungry, house the homeless, build housing for the poor, and care for the young, whether they worship together or not. A place where the destructive tendencies of the modern era were tempered and transformed. I took this class at a time in my life when I was personally going through enormous changes. I had just had my first child. I moved from New Jersey, where I had lived my whole life up to that point, across the country to California. I had just trans transitioned out of a career I had work been working in for almost a decade. That class shifted my worldview so completely that almost everything I did in the following years was informed by what I, was, what I learned there, whether consciously or not. The multiple physical changes in my life, leaving a career, having a child, and moving across country, in some way created an opening in my intellectual and spiritual life to be ready to accommodate a shift. Change is like that. It often manifests on multiple levels at the same time. Change happens on a cusp. Something shakes us out of the status quo and throws us into liminal space, a threshold, a waiting place, where everything is in chaos and nothing about the future is certain. This can happen at, per at the personal level through the death of a loved one, a divorce, the birth of a child, at the communal level, 
because of natural disasters and at the global level. The pandemic was one of the biggest global liminal spaces the world has ever experienced. It stopped everything, shook everything up, made us look at re the reality of the country and the world and made us ask the question, I hope, knowing what we know now, where do we go from here? Liminal spaces are uncomfortable, they are uncertain and they are scary. Our first impulse is to get out of them the easiest way we know how, by going back to the way things were, because that seems safe and stable and known. And the reality is we know that's not true. A loved one is not coming back. The conditions that precipitated a divorce are still there. All the intertwined conditions that precipitated a global pandemic and the inequalities that were made stark in its presence were there before, but we didn't necessarily see them. We know we can't go back to the way things were. What we have seen, felt, experienced in the midst of liminal space cannot be unseen, unfelt, unexperienced. There is only going forward to something new, something different, perhaps something novel that we could not even imagine before. Liminal spaces may be scary and uncertain and uncomfortable, but they are also places of innovation, creativity, and transformation. 2020 gave us the pandemic, but it also gave us the death of George Floyd, which precipitated a huge global protest against police brutality, against systemic racism, present not just in the justice system, but in many institutions, from education to law to housing to even religious institutions. And it precipitated a renewed interest in learning about, creating communities of practice and engagement around the issue. It made racism starkly visible. Why? Because the lockdowns and isolation had already made us open to seeing the world differently, and we needed something to do. All of us were already experiencing the world in a more communal way, feeling the need to reach out to others in our isolation. We were already feeling a part of something much greater than our individual selves. This change at multiple levels of our consciousness. These liminal spaces are stepping stones to change. And as in between state spaces, there is still a chance to go back or go forward. If we don't have support for the changes we want to make in our lives, chances are those changes won't happen. Several years ago, I was part of a UU leadership course. Board presidents, DREs, other significant leaders from a cluster of several UU congregations got together and spent several weeks participating in this course. We met in person once or twice a month for I think it was about four months um, and in between, we did online homework assignments. When we came together in person, we discussed what we had learned. Part of the class was to get us to think about healthier dynamics within our congregations, but also to figure out ways to work together among the different congregations, be supportive outside cheerleaders for each other, so together we could create and have support for the changes we would be making at our individual congregations. Plans were made, contact information was exchanged, and enthusiastic partnerships and events were proposed. And everyone left filled with enthusiasm to try this new thing. But even after months, nothing changed. We did not follow up on those connections we had made. Those joint events never happened. Because when we brought those ideas back to our individual congregations, those who had not participated in the course, who had not experienced the cam camaraderie and enthusiasm that the participants had experienced, they wondered why we wanted to do these things. Didn't we have enough to do ourselves without planning joint events with people and congregations we didn't know? Change requires community support, and we couldn't muster it because the community couldn't imagine it or, couldn't, or didn't act actively want it. 
One of the biggest impediments to change is there are those who don't want it. It became obvious during the pandemic that those who denied or wanted to go back to normal as quickly as possible were those who benefited most from going back to not allowing the global downtime to be a place for honest reflection, change, and innovation of thinking and being different. The backlash that, to that moment of awakening to systemic racism and injustice, the backlash was swift and fierce. The resulting actions of removing or restricting of black history classes in high schools and community colleges, even ones that had been around for decades. The banning of books featuring black protagonists or histories. The fear of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and institutions from government to education. Voter suppression and restrictions in largely minority districts. All these things were meant to stop or thwart change or even overturn change gained decades previous. Even our most personal moments of change may take years to enact as we put roadblocks and excuses in the way. I didn't go to divinity school until I was in my 50s, though for years, maybe decades, I knew that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't until I had no reason not to that I decided to do it that all the impediments and excuses finally dried up. There are these two notions in evolution called gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. Gradualism is that change evolves slowly over time. Punctuated equilibrium means that there is a steady state for a really long time, and then something monumental happens that changes everything very quickly. Both of these types of changes happen in our lives, even in the lives of the communities we are part of. In religious communities, change happens both ways. We have no choice to change because it is inevitable. People come and go, personalities change, cultural ideas shift around us, and we need to respond. Demographic changes and technological changes happen that shift the ways we communicate. But then, Sometimes a pandemic happens, and we have to change everything we knew, not slowly, but oh, literally overnight. Albert Borgman imagined two different futures from his vantage point of being at the cusp of, the cha uh, at the cusp of change pre-internet. He was correct that there were, at the time, what, that we were at the time living on the cusp of change. That at that time, we were at an inflection point. Envi environmental degradation was already being felt. Commu computer technology was coming into its own. But people were also imagining a safer, more compassionate world. He was not basing that prediction on nothing. He was seeing a change in the ways in which people felt the need for joyous communal spaces for celebration and interaction, where the most destructive forces of the modern era were being questioned in the civil rights movement, the fledgling environmental movements, in the women's movement and the growing movement for great gay rights. He was seeing all those things, and he was trying to figure out which of those trajectories would move us into the future. I believe that both of his visions of the future were realized. The rise of the internet changed everything. There is no doubt about that. Instead of compassionate people figuring out the best ways to temper the worst excesses of what the internet might become, as Borgman suggested, we let a few not entirely thoughtful people create a system that is spiraling out of control. Being used to spread disinformation and hate, to disrupt anything that might lead to understanding and communication. And in many places, though, we have also created small, innovative ways to counter the excesses of a hyper-everything world. With the rise of small organic farms, eco-villages, movements for social change that slowly but surely push back against the structures of oppression. 
We see cooperation across religious communities and widespread interfaith engagement and dialogue. Alternative renewable energy systems are replacing fossil fuels in many communities. I believe we are at another cusp of change. The next few years could bring enormous shifts and not necessarily for the better. Authoritarian regimes are rising across the globe, including domestically. Climate change is already wreaking havoc in unpredictable storms and weather patterns. Almost 20 years ago now, I was at a lecture given by Bill McKibben, the environmental writer and activist. But the first, the first 50 minutes of his talk were about environmental doom and gloom, and the intervening years have shown many of his predictions to be right on target. But he also said, in the last 10 minutes, he said, or we can create an extraordinary, sweet, sustainable society. It is our choice. When we want to make change happen, often it is the small things we do in every day to shift ourselves that leads us to small changes in our communities and then ripples out farther and farther and farther until we cannot see how our small contributions have spread into the world. None of us makes change by ourselves. We all need support from those around us. But together, we can do anything. Amen and blessed be. Our closing hymn today is not in our hymnal. It is a song called Be the Change, written by Mark Kaplan and Colin Britt. The words are on the back of your order of service. Um, we will listen to the song one time through, played by Nathaniel and Diane, so that you can hear the tune, and then we will sing it together. We will do the three verses and then go back and sing verse one again. Please rise and body or spirit, join us.
Our benediction is by Reverend Lynn Cox, Prayer of Co-Creation. Creative spirit, source of life and love, we give thanks for the beauty of this day and for the company of those assembled here. Thank you for the breezes of change, clearing our heads and bringing fresh ideas. May they cleanse our minds of the oppressions and isms that divide us. Thank you for the flame of hope, the heat of righteous anger, the warmth of compassion, and the fire of commitment. May they bubble the cauldrons of transformation. Thank you for oceans of love, rivers of connection, tears of relief, and pools of serenity. May healing waters flow over us and through us and among us, wearing down the sharp rocks of despair to bring joy in the morning. Thank you for the good earth beneath us, around us, and within us. May we take this clay and co-create a new realm of justice and beauty. Thank you for all these things and more. We accept our gifts and commit to building, sculpting, painting, singing, and dancing them into life, abundant life. May it be so, blessed be, and amen. It is now time to extinguish our chalice as our service is coming to a close. We extinguish this chalice, but its light lives on in the minds and hearts and souls of each and every one of us. Let us carry the flame with us and share it with those we know. Share it with those we love, and most especially, Share it with those we have yet to meet.